With that, I'd like to invite a leader of our congregation who's been a member for the last two years, Floretta Reed, uh, Flo, as she's, she's known to all of us who love her. If you'll come forward into the pulpit, take my place here and share a bit of your story. Flo is a leader on our justice teams and in our intercultural bridging team. I, the reason I wanted Flo to speak today is because when we think of heritage, we often think about looking backward at, at the heritage of this church as we've been doing. But at the same time, a church is like a democracy and a church is like a family. As new people come into a democracy, the heritage of that democracy then becomes part of their, their heritage becomes a part of the democracy. And as new people come into the family, when we marry into a family, our heritage and their heritage starts to blend and become one. When we adopt a child, like my family's done, her heritage becomes part of my heritage, and our heritage is a growing, living thing. And so you bring your heritage, and we want to hear a little bit about your story. Thank you for being with us, Flo. Thank you. Well, good afternoon now. Uh, I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma, a rural Muskogee, Oklahoma, they call it now. When I was growing up, it was just a plain old country. Um, I left Muskogee the day after I finished high school, manual training high school, for Los Angeles, California, to live with my sister and to go to school. <clears throat> I was 17 years old. 50 years ago, some of the members of this church marched in support of Selma's Bloody Sunday. I was on the campus of UCLA marching for the same cause, voting rights. There was also the Watts Riots in South Central Los Angeles going on at the same time. I was a committed follower of Martin Luther King Jr.'s nonviolent movement. I marched in August 1963 in the March on Washington at 19 years old for civil rights. We had listened to Martin Luther King sermons on the radio when he was a young minister even before he started the civil rights movement. So he was my hero. These were explosive times in LA after the riots. People were every police were everywhere trying to control the movement of African Americans in the city. I recall going to the service station to get some gas. In those days, the attendant used to come out and put the gas in your tank. I had gotten out of the car to go buy something inside when four policemen drove up, two in the front seat, two in the back. D drove up they, with shotguns. They rolled down their windows and all of them cocked their guns. And I don't know if you've ever heard the sign, sounds of that guns cocking, but it was frightening. They stopped me and asked me where I was going. What was I, what was I doing on this side of town? And I told them that I was going home and I lived around the corner. And of course, I was scared to death. The sound of those guns cocking terrified me. When I left the service station, they followed me home. I will always remember how scared I was. When I was 21 years old, I took the test for the post office, now the postal service. In those days in Los Angeles, that was a good job for African Americans, but it was also autocratic and military-like structure. You had to follow the chain of command. After five years when I was eligible, I took the test to be a supervisor. For the first time, I started to feel the resistance. How many ways do you face discrimination in life? I was one of the youngest supervisors in the city. I faced it because everybody told me that I was too young. As I moved into middle management, I faced it because they told me I was a female. As I moved into executive level, I faced it because I was an African American and female. In many positions I held, I was the first female or the first African American, and sometimes both. My performance had to be twice as good, and I was still belittled, ridiculed, and isolated because I was different, and it was very lonely. As a youngster, I resented it. It made me angry, and it was beginning to make me bitter. I didn't like the way that made me feel. The rage was nothing that I wanted in my life. As I matured in my faith, there were two verses that I used to get through life. One was, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. And the other one was, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Every time 
one of my bosses belittled me, or a finance manager cut my budget just because he could, I would always say, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I tru truly believe that there is good in everybody. And if they knew they had been hurting me, they wouldn't have done it. In my 30s, I grew more confident in myself, my faith, and my abilities. I began to tell them that their actions were offensive and hurtful. 80% of the time when I did it, they apologized. They did not recognize that they were being offensive or hurtful because they had always did it to anyone that was different without thought. I was the different one. I was the outsider. As I continued to mature, I realized that I had two choices. I could either be angry and bitter and hate, or I could forgive and show love. I chose to forgive and show love. I was tired of going home with my inner lip bleeding because I had to bite the inside of my lip before I got ang while I was angry and not go off on somebody and lose my job. I had two children at home to support. So I chose loved. I looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, how do I make a better day? So the worse I was treated by my white superiors, the better I treated my white employees because most of the time there was a situation I was in. My first upper management job was in Des Moines, Iowa. And when I walked in there, I didn't find anybody that even had dark hair. <laughs> they were all blonde, light hair, or redheaded. But I, be I started to build relationships one at a time. Most of my career, in the eight different places I lived, I was the one that was different. I had to prove myself each time no matter how good my performance was, uh, my previous performance was, I had to start all over. I made people comfortable with me by the way I treated them, not the way they treated me. I knew I was responsible for my actions and my actions alone. We are here today to honor those ministers, presidents, and trustee board members that have guided this church to love beyond belief. I thank you. Each of us has been on a journey over the past 50 years. My journey has brought me to this church where love is the spirit. I see and feel the efforts that are being put forth by the leadership and its members to work together to make the world a better place. I know it can happen. I've experienced it. It won't be easy. It's hard and painful work. I have worked continuously on it especially when I see young black men getting killed in the street by police and each other, or voting rights and other rights being taken away after 50 years for working for it, it hurts. But it will, I continue to pray and thank God for not letting me hate. 80% of the people in this country are good people that want the same things no matter what color, gender, or ethnic background. The issue is we just don't know each other. In most cases, when we get to know each other, we find out that we have more in common than we think. The 20% will not change for whatever reason, and I accept that. I love them anyway. It's easier and happier to love your enemy. It takes their power over you away. So thank you all souls for all that you do and have done. Please continue to love beyond belief. I am glad and grateful to be with people who want to make a difference. It is appreciated, and may God bless all of you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in online. We are so pleased with all the different people who have been tuning in from all over the country and all over the world to our ministry and what we're doing at All Souls here in Tulsa. If you have a chance to send me an email or connect with me in some way, let me know what you're finding, why you tune in and what you're getting out of it. I would love to hear from you. I'm always pleased when I get messages from different people who tell me all kinds of things about the impact of All Souls Tulsa's ministry on them and their lives and their families. And if you get a chance to make a gift to support this ministry, to become a partner, we would love to partner with you and have you be a friend of the church and somebody who is actually supporting us to create this 
congregation and the world that we're trying to create together. You can be a part of it, and every gift of every amount makes a difference. We really appreciate your support.